Hi everyone, I'm Malni Bandaru from Intel and uh, I'll be talking about Bare Metal Trust. Uh, my team, Tan Lin, Wei Chen, Jimmy, that's Wei Gang, myself and Shane, we were involved in this project. We basically developed a proof of concept and uh, next steps will be you know, taking all your feedback and upstreaming this code. So welcome to today's talk. Uh, our agenda is to motivate the talk, but I guess you're already motivated because you're here. Uh, I'll briefly touch upon what we have in terms of software and hardware to establish trust, then ironic with this att attestation, then our demo, and uh, our next steps, which will be our blueprints and references. So the motivation. Um, can we trust? Especially with bare metal, you're giving some tenant your machine and what if they've installed a new BIOS on it or have they installed some new PCIe firmware for any devices that are attached to it? Um, what if they've changed the kernel? I mean, you've just given them your whole machine. Are you confident after they've left it that there's no malware on it? Can we be sure that the next tenant that we will allocate this machine is safe? Uh, is free of malware, it will not be harmed. I mean, there's a lot of liabilities involved here. So um, we were talking to a couple of people about this and Robert Collins from, you know, Triple O and Devananda from Ironic were like, you know, this is something we really need, but is there adequate technology to make this possible? I said, you know, I would never want to give my bare metal again to another tenant. That was their sense. That was the kind of way they were talking. And uh, we said, yeah, we can do this. We have Intel TXT and let's make it do this. So earlier on in OpenStack, we have something called trusted compute pools. It was mainly used for uh, hypervisors and there's already a lot of protection with the hypervisor. Your VM is in there, it's isolated from other VMs so other tenants are not hurt. So it's something nice to have, but this was absolutely essential to have when we started talking about bare metal in OpenStack and ironic giving people appliances to use for their own purposes. So our motivation to detect malware, can we detect changes in the BIOS, can we detect changes in any PCIe device firmware, you know, if you've, you can't really go in there and plug a new devi device because it's in a faraway cloud, but anything that's changed you should be able to detect any kernel changes, any operating system changes, whatever, we want to detect those. So uh, what are we going to use towards this? We're going to use Intel TXT technology and that definitely can detect changes in the BIOS. It can change detection in the number and PCI devices, firmware, kernel updates, the whole shebang. But there is one caveat. It detects this at boot time. So you think about this as chain of trust. Uh, this is your ground level, just the basic. At the ground, what can you change and what can you detect if you've changed it as soon as you boot the system. Another place where this does recalibrate and detect any changes is if your device has gone to sleep, it wakes up, then also all these numbers are rechecked. That's how this whole Intel TXT works. It measures all the systems that are coming up, all the BIOS, uh, then there's called this authenticated code module, so the chain of trust works that way. And uh, what are we looking at in terms of the cloud? Uh, I have these little green circles, they represent compute nodes on which you're going to have hypervisors and we already have trusted compute pools for that. But the nodes that we are now concerned with Ironic for your undercloud launch or for your bare metal uh, you know, delivery, are these little orange and yellow ones. So that's the ones we want to target. Now we want to be able to claim that they're trustable at least when you boot them up and when you release it and are going to give it to a new tenant. So we're focusing on these little orange and yellows. And why do we want to focus on the service nodes? Because you know you want to trust your cloud service nodes too. Okay, so uh, let's talk about what we're using to achieve this. We're achieving trust by using TPM, that's Trusted Platform Module, then Intel Trusted Execution Technology, and OAT is an open attestation service. Okay, let's take a quick look at what it looks like. This is a very enlarged picture, but that little chip up there 
is this thing called Trusted Platform Module. It's a separate piece of hardware. There's a 1.2 release out there and then a 2.0 release that's coming out. The 2.0 release supports additional hash algorithms. It'll be more globally available, so it'll be useful and available in the China and other markets. Uh, the original one wasn't. There was all export licenses. So typically, what does a trusted platform module have in it? It has a random number generator. It has hash, SHA-1 hash generators. It has an encryption decryption engine. It's slow, but it does the job and it's secure. It allows you to save some uh, information that's called a non-volatile memory there. Then when the system is released through the OEM or through the chip manufacturer, you you know, install a little key on it, and that's part of its identity. It's called the endorsement key. So this is a whole bunch of stuff in there that makes some kind of security and attestation claims possible, okay? And now there's this thing called platform configuration registers. There are about 24 of these, and this is where measurements are uh, maintained. So once you start, like, loading the BIOS, it's measured in, it's a hash, it's saved in some PCR, I think like seven or something. Then your kernel is measured, that goes into another PCR, like 17 and 18, and so there's a whole bunch of things. The, how you've configured your system, that goes into another PCR, and there's no way to modify these. They're only measured, and that's something then you can expose to others through a software stack and say, hey, this is the measurement. And you say, oh yeah, that is exactly what I expect, so it's gonna be trustable at that point. So, so our trust stuff, TPM, we've seen it, and then what's all the software stack that I mentioned? So you have like an Intel platform at the bottom, then that little chip that went on top of it, on top of the platform called the TPM. Then on top of that, we're using Intel TXT technology, uh, and that has to, you have to enable the virtualization, you have to enable hardware, and the memory and the BIOS, all of these pieces have to be enabled. Then a piece of software called T-Boot comes in. So you can normally load with Grub or EFI or something else, but this is another way to boot the system and it's called T-Boot for trusted boot. It's open source software, so accessible to anybody who's using a Linux system. Intel is developing that, so that basically makes the right calls uses all this Intel TXT technology, you know, initiates an instruction called S enter and things like that, that starts the whole launch measuring process. So it starts right from, you know, an authenticated code module and then the BIOS being measured and once the BIOS is done, then the option ROMs and so on and so forth. And T-Boot itself is part of that initial authenticated code module. It, it measures it out to see, is this T-Boot a legitimate, valid one? And it's all signed by the provider. In this case, it would be Intel, who's the platform provider. The BIOS is also gonna be signed, but it's gonna be signed by the OEM, which might be HP or Dell or IBM, whoever is the provider. Then a layer of software on top of that is called Trousers, which is really a user level library to access all these PCR contents. And then at the very top, we have something called the open attestation. Then there's a commercial product called Mount Wilson. There are two components to it. There's the client and the server. So the client is the one that will reside on your host nodes that you're gonna be giving away through Ironic to different tenants. And then there's a server component that'll say, hey, you know, give me your values, your PCR, show me your ID card pretty much. And then it'll check against a whitelist that you should have provisioned and say, oh yeah, good to go. Okay, so that's pretty much how this whole software and hardware stack works. So let's just briefly look at what the setup involves to do this. In your cloud, you'll have to set up the OAT server. You'll have to provision known good values, like it's like taking photographs of who's Malni, who's Devananda, et cetera. So you know how these trusted entities look, what their value should be. Then for your bare metal images, that you want to launch, you want to have entirely trusted, you have to give their signatures too. So typically from the OEM, you can get your BIOS and those kind of measurements. And then from the image itself, is it a Ubuntu or is it Red Hat, whatever, what is that one signature? You have to capture that. Then at each node level, when you open the box, when you've got the hardware in your uh, data center, you'll open it, you'll say, hey, you know, 
enable the TPM in the BIOS, you'll say enable Intel TXT, VTX, VTD, et cetera. The VTD is so that you don't have any direct memory access type of uh, attacks on your system. And you have to take ownership of the TPM. So when it comes out of the factory, it's not owned by anybody so that you know other subversive attacks can't happen. You, the data center provider, will have to accept it and put some password. So currently, these are all manual steps. And it would be nice to have scripts, but we'll need OEM support. And there's a little bit of a chicken egg problem here. The OEMs will say, you know, if a lot of people are going to use it, then it's worth making it. And then a lot of people say, hey, you know, if it's already available, it'd be easy to use, that kind of stuff. And then after you take ownership, there's also this issue of saving this password. And this is where maybe Barbican can be used. Another OpenStack project. So uh, what else do we need to do as part of this setup? In Ironic, just like in you know, Nova Compute, you specify flavors and you can say, I want trusted. You would have an Ironic flavor and say, I want it trusted. And as I said, we have to spe uh, specify you know, whitelist, provision that. You can do this either through iPixie or Pixie Boot, both work. You'll need to inject the OAT client into these images of yours that you want to launch. In some cases, you don't need to, like uh, there are certain distributions like Ubuntu, et cetera, where the OAT client is already baked in, into the uh, distribution. But if not, you need to do that. Then after the ironic second boot, first you have the deployment boot. Uh, you know, for those who know what the ironic, how it works. And in the second boot is when you actually boot up the image that the end tenant wants. Uh, that's when all this attestation piece starts kicking in. So how does the workflow go? I mean, you have the hardware, they have the BIOS, the T-boot, the image. Then you first enable everything. Then you have your glance image that you want to download. So that's the second step. It boots. What happened to number two? Ah, there, there's the ironic boot, sorry. Then the PCR hash values that you have to send up to OAT, and then it you know, compares, contrasts, checks everything, and then says, hey, it's all good to go. It's trusted, allocate to tenant. So the last steps, four and five, are not quite that way. We want it that way. If it comes back untrusted, you don't want to give it to the tenant, so that's a piece that we have to still address. Uh, so let's go to the demos. and. Sorry, 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 mouse, behave. Okay. What happened to the mouse? This is the longest of the little videos. OK, we need to go to the beginning. Stop, stop, pause. OK, here we go. So the very first one out there is our OAT server. And the plan now is to launch a new VM. And uh, we call it our OAT client. Everything is pretty much how you would do it today. You choose your image. You Choose your flavor. And you say, go. And it's a real nice system. It does this little thing. And it'll come soon. OK, good. And there it came. We still don't know if it's trusted. OK, and this is the second Pixie boot, as I mentioned. The monitor's a little dirty. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is its monitor. It's booting up. So we're just seeing that whole thing run by. 
and it's a T-boot uh, bootloader that we're using. And as it works, all those measurements are going into the PCR registers. Oh, and by the way, this is the client is a Java client. So that's been a bit of an issue with like Susie and all saying, hey, we'd prefer a C client. So if there's enough adoption, it makes sense to, you know, rewrite it in C. Hey, and look, it's trusted. Okay, so uh, how did all that magic happen? It booted, it had all those PCR values. We've told it to go talk to the OAT server. And the OAT server says, yeah, it is what you had provisioned. Those are the exact values that I'm expecting. And it says, good to go. So things that we did, OK, where is back to here. OK, so in, let me just go back to my slides one second. So the first of the demos is what we looked at. So the first one was just a bare metal trust. The second one we wanted to demonstrate was detect firmware change. Oops, I made a firewire change, sorry. Uh, so we wanted to detect any firmware change, but we had like an, like a you know 10 gig PCIe and NIC, et cetera. So we didn't want to quite mess that up because what if we can't put it back together properly? So what we said is, let's see what else we can detect. So we said, how about we add another PCIe device? Will we detect it? So the second demo will basically say, I had a new PCI device attached to my system. Will its measurements change? And that's what we're going to demo over there. OK. Back here. And I have to show you number two. And I have to rush here quickly. OK, so we added a NIC card. All, all this is the same old stuff. We can say, how's the weather in Paris while this is going on? I really didn't want to do this online, because what if it takes longer? At least we can do fast forward here. OK, so this is our second appliance. We're launching it. It's still unknown. I think we've done some fast forwarding here. And it's untrusted, OK? So what if you wanted to change your kernel? Because, hey, you know, there was a security update, or yeah, there's a BIOS update because there was some insecurity, and I keep getting those from IT. Um, you want to apply them. And then what happens? It's going to be untrusted if you had the old whitelist values. So next thing you have to do is update your whitelist, OK? So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to pretend this PCI device that we attach is something we want. And let's see what we do after updating it. What happens? Where's number three? And then let's go back here. OK, so see that untrusted? What they've gone now is go provision at the OAT server a new whitelist value. You can't read it, even I can't. So don't worry, we're doing it there. Absolutely, we'll put them up. And if you go really close, you can see, but we'll give you more information. So the untrusted should become trusted. And notice this word called poll instance. We're not rebooting the machine. It's just that the whitelist value has been updated. So in these actions, like you have create snapshot and delete and start and all, we have another one called poll, like go check is it still uh, trustable. And that's essentially what's going to happen. But wait, I don't see that happening. I didn't see him do that click there. He did? OK, I missed it. I wasn't paying attention. OK, bad student here. So that's essentially what you can do. But what's the advantage of having this poll instruction? Um, somebody wants to come and check for audit logs, for compliance. Is this machine still trusted? At least at boot time, was it what we expected? Anytime they want, they can make that API call and get back the answer, true, false. And it does not upset any uh, activity on it, any applications running, because it just checks the PCR values. And that's the guarantee of Intel TXT. These PCR values are only going to be changed at boot time. So they were what you were at boot time. There's another aspect, like if you did any kernel change, anything else, that's when it'll again, like it comes out asleep. Let's say your platform is asleep, it comes back up, then it'll remeasure. So you can track any changes on your system that way. 
Okay, so let's go back here and see what are our next steps. And we go back to from current slide. Okay, so okay, we saw this, we've seen enough of that. Yeah. What are limitations? Um, of course, your bare metal nodes in our OpenStack cloud are all going to be Linux bare metal cloud, I mean uh, images. So you can call it a limitation, but hey, that's what we're, we're going to deal with, you know, Linux bare metal, and our trust too is only limited to Linux bare metal. So it's not like your hypervisor and a VM image that can be Windows. These are all like Linux and our T-boot, et cetera, all works on Linux. Today, what we needed to do was we had to inject that client into the uh, image, the tenant's end user image. So that's what I mentioned about the OSV adoption and the chicken egg problem. Uh, I think, you know, we're talking to Keith and if they see value and all, maybe this will happen. It'll get integrated into Red Hat proper as opposed to being in a side repository. Uh, and as I said, Susie had the issue with the C, uh, they want a C version of the client and you know, if there's enough interest, we can do that. And uh, we had one manual uh, step here, that is all those uh, enable TXD, enable VTX, VTD, and that's where I think we can get help from our OEMs. Uh, if they see enough adoption, we can kind of convince them that, hey, please make some scripts, because these are very, very specific to is it Dell, is it HP, is it IBM, because it's their BIOS and how to change it. It's not something that's Intel specific at that point. And what are our next steps? Um, let's say you have a machine that's uh, untrusted and you want a trusted machine. This is some, uh, this is a moment when you want to alert an admin. There are two options here. I mean, was it an intended change? And definitely during any, you know, integrations, updates, etc., there will be such changes. There will be a moment when you have to update your whitelist. Uh, so good things are like a BIOS firmware, any of those updates that are, you know, security, whatever updates are good. Or is it just a missing whitelist entry and you have to update that? Or is this something really rogue? So you have to determine that piece. So with TXT, there's logs, so you can kind of check what happened when and determine these sort of things to do your forensics there. Then uh, let's say you wanted to assign a trusted bare metal to a tenant and you weren't able to, like the machine that came up that you thought would be trusted is really untrusted. Uh, you can say, um, shall I retry? Shall I try finding another machine after I quarantine this out and you know alert the admin to see what to do about it? Uh, but maybe there we might have to do like two tries, three tries, whatever, something configurable because you do not want this to be another source of insecurity, like a denial of service thing where you have some tenant uploading some random image that is uh, you know, invalid and it has no whitelist entry, so just to make us spin our wheels in the cloud there. And uh, so we have two blueprints out there. These uh, are like just placeholders right now. They don't have their uh, spec.rst file stuff in there for the ironic. But the ideas that all came here, the kind of things that we were asked to address, we got from uh, Robert Collins and Devananda, and these were the kind of things that they were really concerned about. And uh, I think these are addressing those, and so we would look to upstream all this code. And we'd, of course, love your, oh, I didn't need this one. And, uh, and I'll add a few more references, but there's a whole lot of stuff on TXT and Intel's website has a bunch of things over there, and uh, for even our, uh, you know, Horizon demo and modifications, we started using something from Ironic, so it was helpful that the Horizon PTL said start with this, so it made our job easier. So that's the status of this work. Any questions? And these are like, yeah? The hardware that we support is uh, no, no, no. Uh, the limitation that it is is for Intel. It's the Intel platforms that support Intel TXT, and there might be something else in AMD land, but it's not Intel TXT at that point. So it'd have to be something sim similar with a plug-in type of thing. But it works on all our processors for the last four or five years or more, both client, desktop, and the servers. Uh, the thing about it is uh, 
TXT is a little more complex in the server end because there are multiple cores and there'll be one core that'll be loading the BIOS, the others will be in sleep state. So it's just the technology behind it is more complex on the server end, but it's available across our chips. About the flip side, after we've uh, validated that the BIOS and the kernel are correct, how do we, is, is there anything in the blueprints that uh, will be able to prevent someone from going in and uh, reflashing the firmware while it's running, where I understand it wouldn't be detected until the, cert, the system got rebooted? Some things you can't do totally and uh, escape. Like if you were to update the BIOS, and there are different ways in Intel TXT, uh, like I was reading on like, what if that question comes? Um, it does get detected because there's something called a secret flag. Well, I'm, I'm not concerned about detection. I'm concerned about preventing it from happening once we have validated that we're running on the uh, From somebody updating the BIOS like that? Correct. Oh, we can't control that client once they get that machine. Do we have that control? No. It's just that after they've done their mischief, we at least can be sure that it's, uh, uh, you know, we can detect that they messed up the machine before we give it to another, you know, unwary client and destroy their system. So that's where this stops. But uh, uh, there's other work going on, and uh, it's not yet there where you can start doing this at runtime, like, hey, someone's messing around with this piece and detect it. But that's more in your face kind of thing. It's going to use up your CPU cycles to detect. Okay, yeah. Um, with the OAT server, huh. did you have one for bare metal that's in it and then one for the underpower? And one for, for both the you can use your server for everything. The same server will work. Same yeah. question. Uh, is the random number generator exposed to the VMs? N uh, no. This one is mainly for your communication so that you don't have repeat kind of attacks. Like I'll ask you for, hey, give me your PCR values and then this is for the generating a nonce type of thing. Or if you ask for some more public private keys, then it'll bubble down into this and give you those keys. So it's not like a high bandwidth or a no, 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 no. Yeah, the, the, the TPM stuff is all very low bandwidth, but one of those considerations, and it all comes on some serial lines, so it was basically more secure, but just to meet this need. Devananda, you. Uh-huh. Um, no, I can't. I'm sorry. <laughs> so in Intel speak, we'll say, I'll take that as an action item and find uh -huh. out. And I'll update the blueprint with that question. Yeah? There are some advantages and disadvantages, and I think this is uh, more useful for uh, they call it like compliance and logging and all. You can always query and say, hey, give me your values. So for uh, like compliance logs, audit purposes, this is more useful. But you don't have that kind of footprint of what happened with secure boot type of solutions. So that's the advantage here. Yeah? yeah. So I have a question related to performance. So what do you see from your huh. that uh, how long it takes to, to verify the top? It's so little. It's all in your cloud. Which changes are you talking about? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, no, but this is not your performance per se when you're trying to give a, a tenant the machine. So you know this. You're the data center operator. You know you're doing a BIOS upgrade, or you know you're going to add some new firmware. You've got some nice 100 gig NIC or something, and you're going to add it to your system. So you've opened the box, and you're going to do it then, or you're going to apply these upgrades at your regular downtime. That's when you'll change the whitelist. That's all. It's not a big deal. It's like no different from you upgrading to your Havana to Ice House. In fact, it's much less of an issue. Yes? Huh. 
then you don't need me to inject your client thing. And th that's kind of, there were a few more slides in the back up there. So that's what our team did. They use a disk image builder. Yes, it's part of oath that you have to do this whitelisting and you would be the trusted entity because you're going to be entering the whitelist. So we're not going to hand the oath server information to everybody. And uh, you use a disk image builder and I'm thinking along the lines that if a tenant wants trusted bare metal, actually we should kind of demand all tenants who want bare metal should go the trusted path, uh, that they should have as part of the image that it's trusted. That means they have the old client in them. So that's the way I'm thinking about this. Yeah? Thank you. That's a good idea, yeah. That, that would be a great tool. So that you make that change means, hey, let me update the whitelist type of thing. Yeah. And in fact, we should also like uh, blacklist the old ones that might not have had a security update so they can't get into the system. Yeah. Good point, Rob. Yeah? Absolutely, they have to be 100% the same. So this is, uh, that's like the caveat. That's the starting point of all this. You have the same hardware, the same BIOS, the measurement is the same. And it should be, why? Because BIOS is binary code, it's zeros and ones. The hash of any binary string, I mean, as long as you haven't changed the string, is the exact same hash value. So you're not using anything, you know, like variable in the platform, any entropy related stuff. It's basically software that you're measuring. Yeah? Well, Louise, just to clarify, did I hear that correctly that, so if I have a mix of like Gen 7 and Gen 9 servers, I can't use this? You can, except the signature would be different. But all their signatures would be different. Did you repeat the yeah. question? Oh, yeah. So I, I was just asking how, can any level of heterogeneity be in the hardware or not? It sounds like you're saying yes, it can be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So heterogeneity is possible, except that, you know, let's say your Gen 9 and Gen 7 had a different BIOS, so signature would be different. So you would have two whitelist entries, yeah. Yes? Uh, no, no, clients, the old client is on the client machine and it runs. It's the guy that's going to answer the question, like, what's your name type of thing. So, so le let's look at it this way. We want to give this tenant a trusted machine. So at that first point, if we have the old client working and running and it reports trusted, then I'm done. I can give you a machine say, I've, I did my bit, I gave you the trusted machine. Then you, naughty client, go and you know, do upgrade of BIOS, do some other mischief, that's fine. It's just that when you hand back the machine, we'll detect it before we give it to another tenant. Yes, yeah, before you, we don't want to give it to another tenant without sanitizing and checking. So part of, you know, when you return a machine, you'll anyway clear out and you should clear out and there's another talk further uh, down the week about clearing up any memory, et cetera, et cetera, so that you're not leaking information. And then when you give this to somebody else, that's when you do this sort of check. Yeah? Should be, yeah. Certain platforms support that. Most uh, rack mount servers today don't support that. But even in that case, there are still peripheral P side devices, SATA devices, which cannot be locked down by any type of security on the web. So we can't prevent, we can at least detect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes? Um, it's no problem. I mean, just like you would move your workload from one place to another, uh, after you go there, you say, I want trusted, and they should also have some kind of attestation service and things like that. So it's perfectly possible. Do the attestation servers share information? Um, normally, when you have them across clouds, they'll all have their own services. Typically, the OAT server will be in the same 
uh, LAN, etc. So it doesn't talk to a remote old server. At least today it's not, yeah. So they wouldn't share. You would have to whitelist over there. And it makes sense because suppose in your hybrid cloud, let's say in this private cloud you had all your Gen 7s and the hybrid cloud out there, the public cloud had maybe 9s or some other hardware, the whitelist values would be different anyway. The only thing you want to claim is that it's trusted or not. That's all. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, do you have any idea for support of customer, uh, customization kernel? Huh? I didn't understand the management workload going up thing, but if you have a custom kernel, uh, you would have to tell the uh, the cloud provider that, hey, this is my personal kernel, I totally trust it, it has this, uh, you know, SHA-2 signature, whatever, please make a whitelist for it. And that's possible. And typically what happens is when you're doing this sort of whitelist measurement, you put it in a little isolated box away from any network, then just boot it up, whatever readings you have, you then push it to the OAuth server and say, this is my whitelist set, you know, values. So that's typically how it does. So your custom kernel would be doable that way. But from a self-service point of view, you know, we need to somehow create this workflow to whitelist it. Yeah. But good question. Yes? Say that again. Uh-huh. That's possible. So, um, good question. We can break this up into two parts. Remember I mentioned there were like 24 odd PCR registers. You could uh, break this down into, I'll call it trusted, only if the hardware BIOS and the option ROMs and that part is right, then I call it trusted. Customer, you can run any kernel, be my guest. We can do it that way. So the OAT uh, attestation piece, you get to choose which PCRs you want, do you want all the 24, do you want only number 17 and 18, uh, because you do want to control like the configuration one, so maybe more than like two, so there might be like seven or eight instead of all the 24. Yeah, so that's a possibility, yeah. Any other questions? Hey, awesome audience, thank you. Thank you.